Lovely to be with you. Really appreciate the invitation, and I'm always glad to be at the lifeboat. It is lots of wonderful memories for me. I have great memories of this place, and especially its former and formative days when I was very much involved, and uh, those were wonderful days when God really did come down into the midst, and especially the prayer meetings, when the Lord would come down in great power, and so I have really precious memories. And when you encounter God in your life, it becomes like a little marker. Uh, you see, you have a better view of things. And the higher up you go the mountain with God, the better you'll see, and the less you'll desire to stay in the lowlands. And I'm grateful to God for many memories where God brought me up the mountain in this place. And I do trust and pray that the work will continue and that God will bless it and that truly the best is yet to be. I believe that with all my heart. The best is yet to be. We're going to turn in our Bibles, please, to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2 and verse 7. Now, it's a familiar verse, but we don't want to take God's Word for granted. We're so grateful to have the Word of God. We'd be lost without it. And I like the words, especially with what I'm speaking on tonight, that Paul, when preaching, called it the Word of Life. It's the Word of Life. There's no other book like it. It's a living book. So we turn to the book of life. And we're going to read from chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Turn over with me now, please, to the book of James, the other end of the Bible. The book of James. Just go back from Revelation and Jude and then you'll hit John and then back to, or rather you'll hit James then. I beg your pardon, I mixed that up. It's after Hebrews and before Peter. James, and we're going to read from chapter 4, and again, it's a very familiar verse in the Bible. Hebrews chapter, or uh, James chapter 4 and verse 14. James chapter 4 and verse 14. And James, the brother of the Lord, is speaking, and he says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious and living word want to thank you, Lord, for your great love for us in that you sent your Son. We bless you for the gospel. We thank you for its truth. And we pray in Jesus' name that you'll grant the anointing and help of the Holy Spirit. Lord, when Paul preached, he said, I preach not in word only, but demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And I pray for the demonstration of the Spirit and power. And I pray that souls would be arrested by the Holy Spirit and convicted and converted and that men and women would be born again. Help us then, Lord, as we look to thee and grant thy help and put a hedge around us as has been prayed, a hedge of light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There was an occasion... In the book of Samuel, whenever Abigail had come to see King David, he wasn't king then, but she came to see him because there was a real threat that David, because of the action of Abigail's husband, he was going to kill a lot of her servants and maybe her herself. But she knew that he was hunted by Saul. And she said a lovely little statement that I never recognized as a Christian until I went to the Faith Mission Bible College. And when I went to the Bible college, our principal used to pray in the prayer meetings, and he always prayed this, 
And I used to wonder where it came from, and then I stumbled on it. It was in the Bible. And this is what Ab- Abby, or, uh, Abigail said to David. She said, my Lord, I pray that you will be bound together in the bundle of life with the Lord your God. I always thought that was a lovely little statement. Bound together in the bundle of life with the Lord our God. That's a good place to be, by the way. She was saying what was good. She says, David, no matter what happens to you, and no matter what Saul tries to do to you, you're in the bundle of life, all the variables of life, all in together, but he said you're with it, with the Lord. That's a good place to be. I hope you're there tonight. I hope in the bundle of your life, you're in with the Lord, your God, (laughs) and you're not without him. Well, my question tonight is similar to last week. Last week I asked the question, what is man? And we went through that as best we could. We're developing it a little tonight and we're taking a slightly different theme and maybe you already know it. What is your life? Not what is man, but what is your life? Now forget about the person beside you and forget about the business tomorrow, some of you are very business, some young men here, and you are thinking, and what will I be doing, and I need to sort that out. Just forget about that for the moment. Because thinking is very important. And one of the beauties of sitting in God's house, and if you have a faithful minister of the gospel and the word of God, is that you have time to think. And that's a good thing. What is your life? Well, everybody could give their opinion as to what life is, and they do. But basically, if you were to kneel it all down, you would have three simple questions that both Christians and non-Christians agree on, and that is, where did I come from? Or some would question it, Why did I come? Then why am I here? What am I here for? And then the other one, where am I going? Now, they're great questions. And I encourage every one of you and anybody who's listening or watching online for people in touch with me during the week saying that they'd been watching the programs and you forget that you have a kind of a living congregation out there. But I want you to think about that. Where did you come from? Why are you here and where are you going? What is your life? One man was deciding to go through life, and he put it into seven words. He said, this is your life in its entirety. Initially, he said, it spills. Those of you who are parents know all about rearing children and spills. And you fathers, if you're anything like me, keeping the car tidy, and you've it all polished, and the child comes in and throws yogurt all over it and sticks everything to it, and you're afraid to touch the back of the car, you feel like just putting a hose into it after they've been in it. Time of spills. But then they have to leave and go to school, and they've start getting educated, and pressures of life. It's a time of hills to start climbing, start learning, and learning fast. And there's some of the little ones here, and you're starting your wee hills. But then there's a time of thrills. Why? Of your strength and your vitality, and there's so many things you want to do and accomplish in life, and you get your phase of thrills in life. But then, of course, when that happens, very soon you get married and you have a family, and then it's bills. You're all familiar with them, and they'll be increasing from what I hear. And from what I've felt as well, I've been running around turning lights off everywhere. I feel like pulling every bulb out of the house, getting candles back. Oh, I time of bills come. You all have all of that. And then the time of ills. 
And the joints get sore and you can't get up anymore and you can't put your socks on anymore without sitting down. Or maybe lying down. Oh, why the time of ills come and then the time of pills come. Whenever instead of cornflakes, you've got a cereal bowl full of tablets. You get there too. The time of pills. And then the time of wills comes. Well, I think that succinctly covers life, doesn't it? That's what covers life. But you see, my dear friends, there was a man in the Bible called Solomon. And other than Jesus Christ, he was the wisest man who ever lived. It was given by God. He didn't achieve it. God gave him, and he, he made him the wisest man. And that's why one of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Ecclesiastes. I love that book. I go through it several times every year. Love that book. It's a man talking from his experience. If you want to understand the context of Ecclesiastes, he's, he's talking about what he has done and what he learned and all the mistakes that he made. And, and, and he's kind of he's giving us a, a review of his life and telling us that all the things he has done and all the buildings that he built and, and all, the, all, the, all the cities that he, that he built and all the wealth that he had and all the, all the wives that he had and, and everything that he had in life and alcohol and, and he had humor and laugh, and he had it all. And he starts the book with these words, vanity of vanity, meaningless, meaningless. Wise men think, fools don't. He was a thinker. And he sat down and he thought about it all and he said, you know, the whole thing's meaningless. And I'm getting on in years now and it doesn't seem that long ago when I was quite young and I'm looking back and I'm realizing all the accomplishments that I have had in my life. I look back at them and I realized that God was in the things that I was doing, but a lot of the material things that I did, I look at it and I say, it's all nothing. It's all meaningless. It's just like a mirage. You think that, that it'll satisfy you or do something for you. And, and when you've it done, if you even get to do it, you, you, you say, well, what was all that about? Well, that's what Solomon said. That's what Solomon said. That was his experience. You see, my dear friends, let me give you a few truths from the Bible as to what God says about our life. The first thing, and you'll know all these, and you'll know them, you'll have talked about it at home, you'll have talked about it uh, at the table, you'll have talked about it. Everybody talks about this. First of all, life is a gift. Now, last week we went through, and I'm not going to do it tonight, we went through the absolute absurdity of believing that man came from a wee blob and protoplasm and eventually a handful of cells formed together and all that stuff. We're not going to go down that route. Using even what we call, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the word, using a little bit of gumption. Just gumption. You'd know it was nonsense. You listened to a man preaching one night, and he, he, said, he said to the, this big scientist, saying, oh, yeah, oh, I, oh, I, absolutely, we came from wee blobs, and he had all his stuff worked out. And the boy said to him, well, he said, that's very interesting. He said, I would just like to ask you, you're a very intelligent man. He said, well, you see, whenever, whenever the first kind of major organ, uh, 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 organization of... of uh, 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 different parts of the bodies and organs of the body all came together to form. He said, did the blood cells, did they form first or, or did the heart form first or, or did the lungs, you know, because that's all necessary for life. You can't work. There's no point in having a heart if you have no lungs, no veins. Which one kind of, mm, he said, now that's an interesting question. Well, he said, which one came first? Because are you trying to tell me that they all came together? By random chance. 
And the more he talked, the more the boy scratched his head and, boy, he wanted out of the conversation. Just gumption. Is it any wonder that God Almighty himself never gives any kind of credence to these so-called smart people? And God says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. God uses one adjective. You're a fool. You're a fool. It might be an educated one. You could be Cambridge or, or Ox Oxford, but you're still a fool. It's a gift. The verse we read together is that moment, and I often imagine it, whenever God had created man, and he's just a lifeless body. That's all he is, a lifeless body. But he has everything there. The eyes are there, the ears are there. God knows what he's making. But th th this, this guy who's made, he's lying lifeless on the ground, made from clay. The Bible says that God came right over him. And the Bible says that he got right down to his mouth and God breathed into him. I love the word in the Hebrew of the word that was used because it's ruach. Ruach. And it actually conveys the actual truth of the breathing of God. Ruach. God breathed his breath into this lifeless form. And whenever the body... And God gave the Spirit when they came together in the middle, a soul was created. And that's how man was made. Gift from God. Gift from God. Where did it come from? Came from God. Came from God. That's where I came from. You see, my dear friends, whenever we're born into this world, God already has a plan for us. God has a a, a blueprint inside in the soul. And when you come to Christ and when you follow Christ and you yield your life to Christ and you're filled with the Spirit of Christ, that blueprint will begin to manifest in you and you'll begin to know the will of God. But I'm running ahead of myself. It's a gift. Your life's a gift. Your sight and your hearing, your ability to smell and touch and taste, all gifts from God. I hope you thank Him. I hope you thank God that you can see and hear and all the gifts you have. But not only is life a gift, life, my friends, is brief. It's very brief. James says, what is your life? It is a vapor. A wee bit of puff of smoke out of the kettle. It's just out and gone. <laughs> I was talking to a man one day, and he says to me, you know what I found out? He says, my life's like a roll of toilet roll. I says, is it? <laughs> he says, when you get to the end, it goes fast. <laughs> well, that's true. When you get to the end, it goes fast. The brevity of life. Oh, my friends, so long. So long we have lived, so many years, and yet, isn't it like that? It's not so true. We all say that. We all agree in that. Life is brief. But in James chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says that our life is like a flower. It grows up and then it's cut down. It withers, it's gone. You see, my dear friends, he's not speaking there primarily just about the brevity of life but he's talking about the decay. Now, that's very interesting about the flower growing up and cutting down and, and it's gone. You see, that speaks very powerfully to us. And God uses the flowers of this creation that we're in to speak to us. I hope you know that. All creation speaks. And that wee flower fades and goes down. And that's every year to remind us that's what's going to happen. It's not God's plan, mind you. It's not the original blueprint for man, but in the providence of God it happened. Don't ask me to explain why, because if I could explain to you why, I would be God, but I'm not God. But I believe God is big enough and wise enough and has a better mind than the mind he created inside me to understand, and he knows that it's worth doing. And if he knows it's worth doing, I'll settle with that.
You see, my dear friends, the flower fades. And doesn't that happen too? The flower fades. And we begin to feel. And for those who get into old age, and then, of course, life becomes a burden to themselves. And then, of course, when death comes, God said to Adam, if you take of this fruit, you'll die. And when he did, God said, dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And my friend, it's hard when you stand at the loved one's graves and you're fighting back the tears and your heart's heaving inside you and you're leaving that loved one into the cold clay. That's very hard, but that's the fulfillment of God's own word. God said, dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And if Jesus doesn't come back, that'll happen to me. And it'll happen to you. Yes. The flower decays. But then the Bible says in Job 7 and 6 that our, that our days are faster, quicker, than a weaver's shuttle. Boys, that's fast. My wife's from Outer Hebrides, the wee island of Harris, and they make the Harris tweed. I remember when the children were small, we went up and there was a little lady, she was a lovely Christian. We used to go and visit her every year. We went on holidays and when we went into our wee home, beautiful wee place called Proclapool. And it lo looked out over, over Harris, over to Sky. Beautiful, absolutely idyllic, beautiful. And this wee woman had her wee loom out in the shed. We went out and we went out in to watch and I said to the children, there were five or six or whatever, I said, now this lady's going to start with her feet with this thing and you keep your eye on that wee shuttle, that wee thing there. You watch that. And their wee eyes were sitting like organ stamps watching this thing and suddenly she started. Whack, whack, whack. Man, you, they looked round at me. I said, you can't see it. You can't see it. It's going that fast. That's how quick your life is. Quicker than the weaver shuttle. Well, you know, friends, that's fast. But I happen to read, be reading this week, and I want to read it to you, for I've never heard it before, but I want to read it to you. Because a wee bit of education always does as well when we're in a meeting, even whether we're a Christian or not. Will you turn with me to the book of Job Do you see this? In Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. You go to Job. And Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9 and verse 25. And David again is talking in the same, in the same manner, or here uh, David, uh, or rather Job is speaking in the same manner. He's conveying the same thought of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, 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 the weaver and the speed of the shuttle. But then he comes to verse 25, 9. Look, look at chapter 9, verse 25. He says, now my days are swifter than a post. What does that mean? It means a runner. A runner or somebody on a horse or a dromedary. In that day, that was, that was the rocket of that day, by the way. He says, that's how quick my days are. I thought, you know, that's great, that's fast too. But where do you come to the next one? Look at the next verse. He says, they are passed away as the swift chips, as the eagle that hasteth to the prey. He says, my days are swifter than an eagle. That's when they're in the sky, the bald eagle, and he's making a nosedive for to get the rabbit or whatever it is on the ground. He's going for the prey. Do you know what speed he'll go at? On average, 175 miles an hour. You need good brakes. 175 miles per hour. Job says, that's my days. You see, my dear friends, what you can see from what we have talked about is, first of all, that life's a gift, and secondly, that it's brief, and that we decay, and that it goes extremely speedily. Uh, we all understand that, and should we all agree with that? So life comes to an end, but nobody wants it to come to an end. And people put themselves through terrible pain and they permit the doctors to do all manner of things upon them, even when they're not enjoying it and they endure this because they love life. 
You see, there's something in us that loves life. There's something in us that wants to keep living. We have this problem of accepting death, of accepting the end. And I hear people, sometimes they amuse me, only it's so serious. I see them on television and I read about them and they say, Oh, there is no God. There's no God. And I'm an atheist. And then they maybe go to some wee place and they fix some wee thing belonging to their daddy or their granny and, oh, they said they'll be here looking at it. They'll be watching us now when we're fixing this wee thing. And have their coat on. I feel they're with me now with my coat. No nonsense. No nonsense. You see, even among the people who are atheists, when it comes to the bit, many of them during the bombings in London when they blew up the buses, a number of atheists were interviewed and they said, I don't believe in God, but when I was in the midst of that, I prayed. Didn't know who I prayed to, but I prayed. Oh, I, my friends. Eternity is in the heart of man. You can try and arrest it. You can try and reject it. You can try and deny it and push God out. And the reason many people push God out is the simple problem. They know that they're accountable for their sin and they don't want to keep God because that means there might be a judgment and we'll be tied if there's a judgment. We'll be tied that God would take us to the courtroom for how we've lived. We'll be tied that the Bible was right that man dieth and wasteth away man giveth up the ghost and where is he? We'll be tied if we said, my friends, it is appointed unto men once to die and after this, the judgment. Mm. The judgment. Well, what happened then? Can we understand this dilemma of why we want to live and yet we have to die? What's the answer to it? It doesn't make sense. The answer is that man was never designed to die. I was never made by God to die. It was never God's intention that I would permanently die. But something dreadful happened in the Garden of Eden when Eve and Adam were given a choice and they were told by God not to take of the forbidden fruit and they took it. It was simply a trial by the Almighty. Why he caused it, why he let it, I don't know, but I know he's all wise. I accept that because I'm not as wise as my Creator. But what I do know is that all these questions are in my mind. What I know is that my life's running out. What I do know is that eternity is looming. What I know is that when the veil is pulled back, there's another reality there. You see, my dear friends, what happened was that sin entered and the wages of sin is death. Sin. Yes, it's an old-fashioned word. Yes, it's gone out of the English dictionary, and by law, very soon, I'm sure, in Parliament, they'll vote that they don't want it ever to be mentioned anymore. But it makes no difference. It'll still bring death. Because sin is still in every man, whether he denies it or not. You say, well, Alan, that's not very good news tonight. No, it's not. There's nothing I have told you tonight that's really good news. And the gospel means good news. So, what's the good news then? Well, the good news is that Jesus, God's Son, came to this earth. He was God, the Son. He was the eternal God who always existed, was never created. He, the eternal Son, laid aside his majesty, his glory, and somehow he became a man. And he was born of a virgin unlike any other. He was born of that virgin and he lived a completely sinless life because he was God. He came to identify with us. He came to 
really enter into our world, to enter into our trials, to enter into our pain. And there are those who are in clergy and those who are in churches, and they say, well, he came that we would follow him, and we would, he laid down a good example, and we would try to be good and be nice and behave ourselves and don't hurt anybody and all that. My dear friends, Jesus came to die. He didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. And Paul, when he was writing to the church in Ephesus, he said to these people who were now Christians, he said, you know, I remember you whenever you weren't Christians. I remember the type of people you were, your, your, your sinfulness, your greed, your, your foul tongue, your, your, your immorality, your perversion, your worldliness, your godlessness, your hatred of your parents. He said, I remember all your behavior. But he said, you hath God brought to life who were dead in trespasses and sin. I want to tell you, dear friend, listening, that if you are not saved by the grace of God, if you have never been born again, the terms Jesus used, if that has never occurred, that you've been born into his kingdom, I want to tell you that you're as dead to God as the man or woman in the coffin is dead to this world. That's how dead you are. That's how far you are from God. But you say, Alan, I pray. Okay. There's lots of people pray and they're not born again. There's lots of people who are very religious and they've all got their religion. Surely, surely there's lots of ways to God. No. Jesus would have been hounded out of every country had he come to them today because Jesus did not embrace Buddha and he didn't embrace Allah and he didn't embrace the others and he didn't say we're all all in it together we're all the boys and you come over in Asia you go by you know Buddha he's my pal and and then you come by the Muslims he's my pal and, and we all kind of come together and you get into God's kingdom and Jesus no my dear friends Jesus Christ was not into wokeness as they call it he said I am the way the truth, the life. No one comes to God in heaven but by me. That's exclusive. That's saying they're all wrong. And they are all wrong, my friends. Believe it? I meet people who are religious. I remember on one occasion praying. It was a very educational moment for me. I remember praying for a woman, and she had a few problems in her life, and, and when we were praying for her, something happened. She had come to the Lord, and she was making some kind of advancement, but there were problems. There's many Christians in that category, but she was a little unique. So when we were praying for her, she said that she had been over in Hong Kong at a time, or China, and that before she became a Christian, she was into a bit of Buddhism. You know, Buddha, the big fat boy that people, you know, the big ugly beast of a thing. White people put it around their house, God only knows. If you have it in your house, put it in the bin, it'll curse your house. By the way, Deuteronomy 7 will tell you all about that. Well, anyway... I began to pray with this woman, and she's sitting there. She's as sensible as what any of you are, or look to be anyway. And all of a sudden, she takes her hands up like this, and she starts to do this here. And the more I pray, then she breaks out in a language. And boy, I know it's something like Chinese, for I don't know what it is, but it's very like the Chinese. And she's going to dinger at the Chinese. We stopped. I said to her, what did you do? Oh, she said, on a few occasions I went and prayed, for, prayed to Buddha. Well, I said, unfortunately, through you entering into that, you've opened yourself up and there's an evil spirit, a demon of Buddha has entered you. And you need to get rid of that. 
And there it was. And I said, say a bit of Chinese for me there. She says, I don't know a word of it. I says, you were going a dinger a minute ago there. I never heard anybody talking Chinese like it. A demon. You see, my dear friends, these religions around the world are empowered. These religions do things. There's not nothing behind them. They're demonic. They're of hell. They're of the powers of darkness, and they deceive. And just as Jesus, by his Spirit, fills a Christian and gives them a longing to pray, and they pray in the Holy Ghost, so these people, people pray by demonic power. Why don't we say these people don't have power? Don't be saying these people don't get answers. Indeed, they do. But it's the source of the power is the, is the thing. Well, this man, Jesus, came. And when he was in the earth, he said to the disciples one day, he said, I want to tell you something. The old devil, he says, the thief, he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said, I want to tell you something. Now, they were the first ones to hear this. He said, I'm come. I'm come. What do you come for, Lord? <laughs> what do you come? I am come that you might have life. <laughs> this problem that you have about the dying, about why you're here and where you're going and all that, Jesus said, I have the answer to that. And here's the answer. He said, I have come that you might have life. He said, I have come to solve the death question. <laughs> I have come to solve the sin question. I have come to solve the hell question. I have come to solve the judgment question. And he said, I'll not only give you life, but I'll give it more abundantly. <laughs> he says, I'll give you real life. <laughs> I, used to, I remember in work, when I used to work, well, I hope I still do, but you know what I mean. When I used to work, and there was boys used to come in that were my age, and I would just become a Christian, and they were maybe in their early 20s, and they come in after Friday night, or, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they came Monday morning, and there would be one of them with a big black eye, and there would be one of them, and he was half punch drunk, and all his salary gone, drinking and acting the wag and the fool. I said, boys, how did you get on? We had a great weekend. What did you do? Can't remember. Can't remember any of it. That's not life, my friend. <laughs> That's not life. Life is when God, the Creator, lives in you. That's what life is. <laughs> you say, well, in closing, Alan, how would I get this life that Jesus talked about, this abundant life, or that Paul and others talked about, eternal life? I like that one. I like that one. Eternal life. Now, that solves the problem about the dying, doesn't it? The eternal life. But you see, that means that I'm not going to die. That means that this aspiration inside me to live forever, that's fulfilled. God has offered that. Eternal life. I mean, a million years would be good, wouldn't it? If he said, I've come to give you a million years, you'd, you'd jump for it, wouldn't you? But when it was coming near the end, then you'd feel the same again. I don't want to die. But he didn't come and say, I've come to give you a million years. He said, I've come to give you eternal life. Eternal life. See, my dear friends, what you have to do, first of all, is believe. Believe. Now, why I say that is because Paul said that. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abideth on him. Yes, you've got to believe. Now, this is where our dear friends, the Anglicans and Roman Catholics, make a complete mess of it. They throw a drop of water on a child, and they say, you're now, if you're an Anglican, you're now an inheritor of the kingdom. If you're a Roman Catholic, you say, now your original sin's gone. Many babies did you ever see believing? Many babies did you ever see, I confess I love Jesus? Many babies. Load of nonsense, load of rubbish, not even in the Bible. And they all believe it and all do it. And it's from hell, my friends. It's not true. The Catholics say it. Some of the Anglicans say it. A lot of others say it. What does Paul say? 
Paul says, he that believeth hath everlasting life. I believe Paul. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. Pouring a wee drop of water and a child get it into heaven. Did you ever hear such nonsense? Sure, if that got you into heaven, I would spend my time at my fireman going around hitting every Christian, anybody at all with a fire hose. They yearn. It's a load of nonsense, garbage. I don't want to be rude to people, but I want to waken them. Don't you believe in this old stuff? Don't you believe in this? It's not in the Bible, it's not true, it's not even experimental. You say, well, is there anything else? You know, if you went around Ireland tonight, according to the census, there's, there's about 80% believe, Protestant, Catholic, or thereabouts, 80%. The thing that shocked me was about 20% don't believe anything. So that's a fifth of our population on their way to hell tonight. One in five on their way to hell that we know about. And they've publicly said it and stated it. And they're blinded by the God of this world and they're going straight to the pit, my friend, when they die. That's terrible. In Acts 20 and 21, Paul says, or Luke rather, he says, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith. See, some people say, oh, I believe, I believe Jesus came and died again. And they say, oh, I'm a Christian, I believe, I believe the Bible. You believe the Bible all you want, my dear friends. The Bible says that the devils believe and they tremble, and they do. They, believe me, they do. They believe and they tremble, but they're not going to heaven. And if you believe that Jesus died and rose again and you hold the Bible and you do your wee prayers and all, don't you believe that that'll get you to heaven? For it won't, because the Bible says repentance toward God and faith. There has to be repentance as well. And you know how that rules the wee baby out. <laughs> Boy, repentance. There's awful lies fostered on people. All in the name of God. And not a word of a true. You see, my dear friends, there was a little girl on one occasion. And Jesus was knocking at the door and the little girl got a hold of the door. And she pulled at the door and says, Jesus, come in. Jesus, come in. I want you in, into my life. Lord, come into my home. And she pulled and he, he said to the wee girl, is there a bag behind the door? Oh, she says, Jesus, there is. There's a big bag. What's written on the bag? Sin. Sin. Jesus said, are you willing to let that bag go? Are you desiring for that bag to go? She said, yes, I am. And the bag disappeared. And Jesus came in. Well, you've got to repent. You've got to turn from your sin. Well, my dear friends, reverently speaking, I met people, oh, I want to be a Christian. I'd say the printer's prayer. Oh, Jesus, come into my life and come into my heart. And they had no intention of turning from their sin. They might as well have asked Pinocchio into their heart. Wouldn't have made any difference. It made any difference. Except you repent, you'll perish. What's the result whenever a person repents and believes Christ and opens the door? What happens? <laughs> well, there's a lovely little verse, and it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus said, If any man hear my voice and open the door, just like the wee girl, if I open the door, Jesus said, I will come in. And when Jesus comes in, that's what makes you a Christian, because he brings his presence with him. He brings the Holy Spirit he brings the assurance of salvation. He brings a joy. He brings a fulfillment. He brings a satisfaction. He brings a meaning to life that never was there. He brings a peace to every storm in life. Because the Creator has now come in. Ah, you say, my dear friends, what did Paul say? about this issue of life, and I'm closing. This is what Paul said. He said, I no longer live. 
This is what Paul, if you'd have said to Paul, what's your life, Paul? You're the apostle now. You got saved in the Damascus Road. You got baptized. You followed the Lord. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're doing the Lord's will. You've went through every battle and storm to preach the gospel. You've lived for Christ. You've served. You've pioneered. You've fought the devil. Man, what a life you've lived. What, what's the secret? He says, it's no longer I that liveth. Paul's dead. No longer I. He said, Christ liveth in me. He said, my dear friends, that's life. That's life. When the creator fills you, that's life. You see, Christianity is not a decision. Christianity is a death. The night I got saved, I didn't know what I was fully entering into. I wanted rid of my sin. But what I was entering into with God the night I got saved was I was saying to God, I hate all the sin of Alan Bartley. I, I, I hate his flesh. I hate everything. And my longing is that everything about him would die and the Jesus who has come in would take possession of every area of my life forevermore. And then when I come to the end of the life, the gates will open and bless God, I'll be in heaven. That's what it was all about. Death. Moses writing, he said, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that both you and your children may live. A doctor on one occasion went to see an ill woman. He gave her the appropriate medicine, and two weeks later she died. Went to the funeral, and he talked to the daughter. He said, I can't believe it. I gave her the medicine. He said, this should not have happened. I can't understand it. She said, doctor, don't worry. My mother poured all the medicine down the sink when you left. The medicine for the death issue is Jesus Christ. He came, he died on the cross of Calvary and bore our sins on his body. He died, and when he died and gave up the spirit, he was put in a grave, a grave that was borrowed. But three days later, God, although the authorities, the Roman authorities, the religious authorities, the Pharisees, and all those that hated him said he has to die. He must die. He can't live. We're putting him down. He, he's not right. We hate him and all their views. And they put him to death and he went into the tomb. But on the third day, God said, I'm reversing what the Pharisees said. I'm reversing what the Roman soldiers did. I'm reversing everything because I'm satisfied with who he is and what he's done. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he is a living, vibrant, powerful, soul-saving Savior. My dear friends, if you open your life to him tonight, he'll come in in all his glory and power, and he'll fill your life with what you could never have had in materialism or the things of this world. You say, Alan, in closing, what's the answer to life? Jesus Christ. Well, who's the one who satisfies life? Jesus Christ. Who's the one that fills the emptiness? Jesus Christ. He's the one. He's the one. My dear friends, I used to wonder whenever Paul, and I'm closing now, I used to wonder when Paul was writing, he said, I have a desire to be with Christ, which is far better. Now, I've talked to lots of Christians, and I suppose I'm in among them a bit, in some extent, and you say, well, I'm happy enough to, <laughs> I'm happy enough to live. Oh, I'm just not that excited about dying yet. But Paul said, I have a desire. If you're talking to Paul, Paul was saying, boys, I can't wait to get to glory. He said, Paul, that's powerful. Can we not talk about that just now? We'll talk about a few miracles or something. Paul says, I want out. I used to wonder, how did he, how was that happening? <laughs> this boy wants to get away. And then I realized in 1 Corinthians, <laughs> He tells the story, he said, I knew a man in, in the flesh or in the body, out of the body. I can't tell. He said that he had this experience. He was caught up into the third heaven. He saw things, he said, that he couldn't, couldn't repeat on earth. 
He, he went into a realm. He said that there was that many dimensions that was different to earth. He said it's, it's, it's unrepeatable. He says I, I, there's no context for it. How do you explain it? Whenever you've been there, how do you bring the message back? Sure, sure earth's so, so finite, so limited, so restricted. Uh, and he said, I was in that place, and then the Lord brought me back. And Paul's saying later on in life, he says, I can't wait to get back. I've been there. I've been there. You see, my dear friends, let me tell you, the Christian life is a battle. It is a war. There is a fight. It's difficult. There's many struggles. But my dear friends, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. It's a good fight. It's a good fight. And it's the only fight worth fighting. Forget about Ulster. Forget about the six counties. Forget about the 26. Forget about these, my friend. Get into the fight because that's where the rewards are. That's where the glory is. There's seven million people in Ireland tonight and the majority of them are on their way to hell. And unless the church of Jesus Christ is revived and quickened and men and women begin to call on God and get to prayer and repent for their sin and turn from the evil in their lives and the evil in their behavior and begin to turn to righteousness and and love the Bible, and love God, and begin to cry, and weep tears in the prayer meeting, like our fathers did. My dear friend, those seven million are going to go to hell. I have said before you life and death. Many years ago in America, a Christian man was called home. His mother and father were weary looking after the son. The son had absolutely no interest in the Bible, no interest in God, and was very determined to have no interest. His brother came home from the mission field to, deli to deliver his mother and father from the burden of staying up day and night. And he looked after his brother as he was dying. He talked to him about his soul. He talked to him about him about the need to be saved, about to be right with God. But the brother was pushing, no, I'm not interested. I don't want that. Day after day, week after week went on. And then one day when he was attending to his brother, he felt exceptionally tired. Went into the adjoining room and fell asleep. When he fell asleep, he had a dream. He dreamt that he could see his brother lying in the bed. And then a dark figure appeared in the room. He knew in the dream that it wasn't a good figure and it wasn't something that was going to do any good. But he said it walked over to where the brother was, reached into him, and took out what it appeared to be his soul. In his dream, he tried to call out, he tried to restrain, he tried to intervene. The dark entity said, I have come for my own. I have come for my own. He woke up. Ran into the room next joining, and there... His brother lay just as he had saw in the dream with his mouth open and where this entity had drawn his spirit and his soul out. I have come for my own. My friends, I set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing. Choose life. Choose life. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will continue to work in lives, Lord. We pray that men and women will turn from their sin. I trust the Holy Spirit to continue to work. Amen.